Welcome back. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to now introduce, uh, not last, <laughs> but the most uh, important, I think, of our speakers, because I have uh, very much wanted to hear more about um, the indigenous population in the US, and in particular, uh, Dr. Carletta Chief, who is a member of the Diné Nation, which is also known as the Navajo uh, Nation. She uh, is an associate professor and uh, extension specialist in the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona. As an extension specialist, she works to bring relevant water science to Native American communities in a culturally sensitive manner. Two of her primary tribal projects are the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe Climate Adaptation and Traditional Knowledge Project and Gold King Mind Diné Exposure Project. In partnership with Diné College, Dr. Chief leads the NSF Indigenous Food, Energy and Water Security and Sovereignty Program and is training 26 graduate students, 26. She, in this program, uh, the, the vision is to develop a diverse workshop with intercultural awareness and expertise in sustainable food, energy, and water systems, specifically through off-grid technologies to address the lack of safe water, energy, and food security in indigenous communities. Dr. Chief received her BS or Bachelor of Science degree and Master's of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Stanford University. And in uh, 2000, uh, in 1998 and 2000. And in 2007, she received a PhD in Hydrology and Water Resources from the University of Arizona. The title of her talk is Climate Change Impacts on Water Resources of Native Americans in the US. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Chief. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. It's wonderful to be here today. And thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this important uh, discussion and dialogue today on climate justice and equality. Today, I would like to talk about the climate change impacting the water resources of indigenous communities in the United States. Next, to Native Americans, water is sacred and is tradition. In contrast to the utilitarian view of water, to Native Americans, uh, water is sacred, water is life. Water is used in many different purification rituals, religious and cultural ceremonies, even family blessings to acknowledge our relations and recognize our connection to Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the ocean. Water is not just viewed in a singularity form, such as its location in the marine or terrestrial or atmospheric uh, places, but, also, but water is viewed more holistically as the integrating component of the whole water system and how it connects everything, the continents, the planets, uh, the, I'm sorry, the plants, the humans, um, and how it's a, a continuous medium for different states of water as, uh, as a liquid, as a vapor, um, as a solid state. So water gives life, uh, and as humans, we are conceived in water, and, and we're born in water, and we, we return to the water upon death. And for me, as a Dene woman, as a Dene scientist, as a Dene hydrologist, this is also very important to me. Um, and at this time, I want to introduce myself in my own uh, language, which is Dene. 
yad e anov to she e ya toraj eat min shle to hana bashish chin as a slane da shi che do ya e de net ha chini e da shi nala a kwat a e san en shle a do de se jim baga de yasi shara ho a what i shared with you in my own language is my identity which three of my four clans are water based and I am bitter water born for near the water. My maternal grandfather is midi goats and my paternal grandfather is red running into the water. This is how I identify as a Dinna woman. And in my culture, uh, water itself is also has um, different identities. For example, the monsoon rains are considered male rain, um, which represents thunder and lightning, and female rain, which represents the gentle showers. And together they unite on mountains um, around this area, and they spring life on Mother Earth um, during the spring seasons. And then that casca cascades into the cultural um, events as well as the livelihoods um, uh, uh, associated with farming. And so like many other indigenous nations, uh, to, to us, um, the water gives us our identity and we acknowledge that identity. Next slide. Climate variability and climate change are currently um, impacting our world with changes in precipitation regimes and increasing uh, extreme events. And these um, impacts are altering where water is in our world, um, such as uh, permafrost thawing and earlier snow melt and also impacted habitat, where uh, habitat uh, are and also leading to their decline. Changes in water quality associated with nutrient cycles or um, uh, dust plumes. And all of these changes are also impacting Native Americans in the US. But how can we really uh, assess what those impacts are. Um, the impacts uh, will not all be alike, and they will vary across the United States according to their regions. They will also vary uh, tribe to tribe because each tribe is very diverse. They have their own tradition, their own culture, language, ceremonies, and histories. Today, there are, are, are over 570 federally recognized tribes in the United States with over uh, 5 million tribal members. Um, and also there are state recognized tribes. With uh, these uh, various tribes, um, I wanna focus on those living on tribal land. So this is a map of all the tribes across the United States shown in maroon. In order to really think about those unique impacts, I worked with a, a group of indigenous and non-indigenous researchers to assess that. And what we did was we grouped the tribes according to these broad regions and uh there are six regions um but we also included hawaii although although they're not federally recognized um native hawaiians have a very um similar and parallel ideals as um the native americans in the united states this graph shows uh the various regions, uh, and we can see that Alaska has the largest number of tribes in the United States, followed by the Southwest uh, region uh, with over 170 tribes. 
And then the and then the other regions, the Pacific Northwest, the Great Plains, the Midwest, and the East Coast um, are all uh, much smaller number compared to Alaska and the Southwest. And then Hawaii is zero, but again, I do want to recognize um, our Native American, uh, Native Hawaiian uh, brothers and sisters there in Hawaii. Next slide. So what we did in this approach was we examined the climate change vulnerability based on a hazard and disaster risk reduction framework that is set in a medicine wheel. So what you see here is a medicine wheel. And maybe some of you um, have seen this um, in, in your lives of um, this very colors of white, yellow, black, and red. And we want it to show it within a medicine wheel, mainly to show how uh, tribes are very connected to spirituality and cultural values within um, their society. And so this diagram shows the climate, the changes in climate, hydrology, and ecosystem as the hazard, which is perturbing a system and how we can characterize those um, impacts from this perturbation can be categorized according to these five factors, which I want to talk about further. Um, so specifically, uh, socioeconomic factor, political factor, infrastructure, ecosystem services and land use, and spirituality and culture. These factors are um, unique factors uh, associated with Native Americans in um, the climate change impacts that they experience. Next slide. So first is the socioeconomic factor. 69% of American Indian Alaskan Native communities are greater than 2,000 people. And 78% of these communities are in rural areas. They also have a higher water supply, water supply cost because of greater transportation costs and smaller economies of scale. So social economic factors are important because this factor um, should be considered when we're talking about climate change impacts in Native American communities, because there's an important community structure in rural urban compositions that are associated with social vulnerability. So similar to other indigenous peoples around the world in developed and developing countries, Native Americans residing on tribal lands in the United States are often living in rural communities with smaller populations and with lower socioeconomic conditions. They also experience greater political marginalizations than their non-Indigenous counterparts. And all of this, these factors, these economic conditions affect how a tribal community manages their water resources and how they are able to respond to climate change. 15% of employment um, on native lands are nearly double the rate of unemployment in the United States. Household income is uh, 30, about 33,000 and is 36% below that of the US. 29% of Native Americans live below poverty level. And so, this is something really important to consider when we think about Native American communities. So here are some photos of a Hopi village uh, in Arizona uh, sh showing um, the adobe structure and how they're clustered uh, in a high desert climate. And then in, in contrast, you can see in uh, Alaska, the Nutuk Alaskan village, um, where there's a much more um, 
a wetter climate and two different really uh, different uh, communities, one in a very dry climate, one in a very uh, wet climate. And um, so how they respond to climate change is going to be very different because of just where they are located. The second factor is political factor fa factors. And for example, um, Native American, federally recognized Native American tribes in the United States are sovereign nations. And what that means is that the tribe uh, has a nation status within a nation. So it's a nation to nation relationship where the leader of the tribe, whether it's the president of the tribal nation or chairman or governor of the tribal nation will have political uh, relationships with the president of the United States. And so uh, associated with those political rights are um, federally reserved water rights, where uh, often their water rights supersede uh, state rights or other uh, state stakeholders, stakeholders. Tribes, although have fixed boundaries because they were restricted to these boundaries, also have uh, traditional territory that go outside of these fixed boundaries. And so oftentimes tribes have off reservation uh, sustenance rights um, associated with hunting, um, or gathering. However, they're also impacted by off reservation pollution and impacts because they're part of a watershed. They may be downstream of cities. Um, and so they're also uh, subjected to off reservation impacts. But at the same time, they're often underrepresented in the discussions around water within the watershed, within um, water management policies. And so together, these political factors result in environmental um, impacts uh, associated with climate change that have very uh, complex legal aspects to it. In this slide, what I'm showing is um, the Crow Tribe Water Settlement of 2010. And uh, it was uh, a, a, a settlement in which the tribe was able to define their water rights and be able to have senior water rights and be able to uh, define what waters are, are theirs. Next slide. I now want to talk about infrastructure factor. Um, so infrastructure is important to consider when we're talking about uh, climate change impacts to Native Americans because tribal infrastructure may not be designed to accommodate climate change impacts, resulting in, in further deterioration of their existing structures um, and may also lead to the, the decreasing the effectiveness of their water infrastructure. For example, um, changes in water quality, and uh, may not their water treatment facilities may not be able to meet a specified water quality standard. So this could lead to service disruption or restru service disruption, uh, resulting in economic or even public health consequences. So within um, tribal communities, uh, um, some tribes that have um, lo uh, less access to good water infrastructure um, will experience greater impacts. So um, many tribes may not even have these water infrastructure um, or they may be inadequate or poorly maintained, um, thus increasing the vulnerability of the tribe uh, to climate change impacts such as flooding, drought, or even waterborne diseases. Um, flooding and other types of climate change impacts can damage existing water 
uh, infrastructure that could increase costs of providing water, which can quickly drain tribal finances. Um, but even without climate change impacts, Native Americans already face water infrastructure challenges. 12% um, of Native American homes lack safe and adequate water supplies um, and or waste disposal facilities in comparison to less than 1% of people in the United States. In Alaska and on the Navajo Nation, um, those percentages can be um, ranging from 13 to even as high as 40% of households that lack access to water and have to haul water. Um, when you're hauling water, um, these tribal uh, members that have to haul water are um, more susceptible to waterborne diseases or even water contamination um, because of, you know, at hauling from non-potable sources or even the way that uh, water is hauled. Um, the container that is used and the sanitary, sanitary um, uh, non-sanitary ways that the water may be hauled. Next slide. The next uh, factor I want to talk about is ecosystem services and land use factors. Because climate change can lead to ecosystem changes, uh, climate change also affects ecosystem services that are important to tribes. And many tribes engage in subsistence and cultural activities, such as fishing, ranching, gathering of medicinal uh, plants and herbs. Um, and in the slide, what I'm showing to you is a tribal member holding a fish. Many tribes um, have livelihoods based on the fish, um, and they also do other uh, types of gathering for, for uh, cultural purposes, like for basketries. And uh, many tribes also depend on groundwater and uh, for, for either um, watering their, uh, their livestock or for drinking water. So if the groundwater is um, shallow groundwater sources, that's going to have uh, vul quick vulnerability to climate change impacts or drought. So in addition to climate change impacts, um, there's depressed economic conditions, fixed marginal lands, um, impacts from off-reservation uh, uh, communities, there's also land use changes, uh, invasive species, all which are stressing the ecosystems that are important to Native American communities. Next slide. So the last factor and probably the most important factor I would say is spiritual and cultural factors. And when you really um, want to understand Native Americans and their deep connection to the land. This is one, one key aspect that is also important to consider when you think about climate change impacts to, to tribes. Because Native Americans are intimately connected to the places in which they live through their spirituality, through their cultural livelihoods and their values, and, and the previous speaker uh, spoke about traditional eco ecological knowledges. Native Americans are the keepers of these complex and extensive bodies of knowledge that have been passed, up, passed on through generations. Um, as I stated earlier in my introduction, uh, we associate strongly with our identities with the waters and the lands. Um, and we seek spiritual and religious inspiration from them. For example, uh, particular locations uh, such as mountains or springs are held sacred. Uh, certain waters may be used for ceremonial purposes. And uh, many Native Americans respect and hold sacred the individual role of species 
on Mother Earth and sometimes even higher than the human species. Um, so uh, with um, this understanding of the connection to uh, place, the environment, waters, that um, can, though impacts to that can also impact the spirituality and the cultural livelihoods of Native Americans. So it's important to consider that when you're um, uh, thinking about Native Americans or if you want to work with tribes. Next slide. I now want to talk about these different regions across the United States and to share some example um, from a bird's eye view. And then later on in my talk, I will talk about the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe and then talk about indigenous resilience. So I'll first start with Alaska. Um, so Alaska is um, as large as a third of the continental US. It's home to the largest number of Native American communities. Um, many of which are villages, which are small and isolated and um, along the coast. And many Alaskan tribes uh, engage in subsistence hunting, such as hunting for walruses or caribou, fishing for salmon. And their livelihoods are so dependent on the state of Alaska's rich water resources. But much of this water is frozen most of the year and it's locked up in glaciers or frozen ground. However, um, Alaska is experiencing and has been experiencing for some quite some time, some of the most profound warming in the world. And so these impacts are impacting the subsistence activities of Alaskan natives it's causing river riverine erosion, um, which is shown in this photo where um, Alaska Native tribes have even uh, had to relocate because of uh, rising sea levels. And with permafrost melting, um, it's also creating hazardous conditions for subsistence hunting where thinner ice and cracks can um, lead to hazardous conditions. Um, and then permafrost thawing, which um, is also a challenge um, where it's also uh, disturbing the water infrastructure. Um, and, and so in addition to the infrastructural challenges, there's also changes in the water quality, such as um, algae blooming with the warming, warming that is occurring, and um, it's impacting the ecosystem as well. Next slide. I now want to talk about the Pacific Northwest, where the Pacific Northwest is home to 42 tribes, and much of the water is uh, held within the mountain snowpacks and released in the April to July snowmelt period. These rivers are home to uh, several keystone stone species that the tribes are dependent on like salmon. And so salmon, they are co-water species, um, the fish that start in fresh headwater streams as eggs, and then as juveniles are flushed to lower river estuaries to acclimate to salt water. So they migrate, they have this migration season, but with um, climate change, that cycle and the cues for um, the cues associated with the temperature in the water is being disrupted. And with many Pacific Northwest tribes, they um, have livelihoods associated with salmon fishing, but also ceremonies associated with the salmon. And so you can see that even though, um, you know, this is happening to the salmon, it's also impacting the ability of their livelihoods and the ability of the people to continue to maintain their ceremonies. Next slide. Um, so here are some other examples of impacts to tribes in the Pacific Northwest. 
So the Swinomish tribe uh, in Washington, they rely on very shellfish as uh, staples uh, for their food and also for their culture. And as the sea level is rising, it's um, causing flooding and uh, impacting their estuaries, which are critical habitat for the shellfish. And then ocean acidification is also disrupting the calcification of development of these um, different marine organisms. And these are all traditional foods important to the tribes. And um, in terms of the gathering of uh, um, roots and, and berries, they're also in, being impacted by soil um, salinization as a result of sea level rise. So um, another example is for the Ho tribe. Um, here's a photo of them and the coastal erosion forced the Ho tribe to relocate to National Park Service land. And also um, nearby tribes have are considering relocation. Um, in a recent news with Hurricane um, Ida that just occurred, um, I have some um, friends down there uh, in Louisiana they have been facing um, relocation for, for many years now, for quite some time. And with this recent um, hurricane, um, they're also being impacted today. Next slide. So now I want to talk about the Southwest. Um, so in the Southwest, where I am in Arizona, there are 170 tribes um, located in um, uh, various uh, urban to rural settings. They have small and large lands. And some of the key climate change impacts them from drought and flooding. And that affects um, the livestock, agriculture, um, the water supply, uh, soil quality, and even the aquatic species. And with uh, with declining water levels, I think many of you have seen these in the news, um, really low levels in Lake Powell and Lake Mead, there's an emergency declaration um, by the Biden administration. Um, this is, is a really um, severe uh, issue right now because many of the tribes have not even defined their water rights. And so and many of these tribes have senior water rights. Um, some other examples are um, wildfires. Um, some of the tribes here have their, uh, very forested lands. And um, I think this year, you know, we've had a record number of wildfires, but even, you know, two decades ago, these tribes were having to deal with wildfires on their lands. Uh, many, many tribes engage in ranching, and um, because there's less and less water, um, there's been some incidents where there's been li large number of livestock die-offs, as well as um, having to just sell a uh, large amount of livestock in a short, short amount of time. Next slide. The next area, a region I want to share with you is the Great Plains. So there are 70 tribes in the Great Plains from Montana to Texas, um, with the Rocky Mountains serving as the western edge. Um, and historically, this area has been seen as uh, used as gra grasslands for bison, but also more recently today, like many tribes in the southwest, there's um, uh, agricultural ranching, tourism, and uh, efforts in renewable and non-renewable energy. So with climate change, it's also impacting these areas, but key impacts are um, those impacting the water supply for these livelihoods. And I want to share some example. In North Dakota, the Sandy Rock Sioux Tribe they depend on a sole intake pipe from the Missouri River at the Fort Fort Yates uh, for its water supply. And in 2003, a drought caused water levels to drop so low that silt and sludge clog the pipe. 
and the tribe didn't have water for several days, uh, the Indian Health Service Hospital had to temporarily shut down. Um, there's also heat waves. In Oklahoma and Texas, um, there was a historic drought and heat wave in 2011. And um, it caused difficulties in producing enough food uh, to sustain their uh, livelihoods, to feed their livestock. And um, the tribal ranchers had to prematurely um, buy a, uh, sell off their um, stock, uh, livestock. Next slide. Um, and then finally, in finally, or second to the last is the Midwest. Um, so in the Great Lakes, there are 30 tribes and this, you know, the, the Great Lakes are very unique because um, it's a water rich area with fresh water. Um, the tribes here rely also on commercial fishing, um, gathering of water based plants for traditional crafts and artwork. And also the tribes also engage um, in gaming um, and other tourism enterprises that rely on water for aesthetic and recreational purposes. Um, what's really great is that the Michigan tribes have worked really hard um, in their state to recognize impacts of climate change. And in 2004, um, they established an intergovernmental accord between the tribes of Michigan and the governor of the state of Michigan concerning the protection of shared water resources. And so they've been leaders in terms of talking about climate change um, because they see its impacts. For example, one of the key impacts that they've experienced is flooding, um, which destroyed uh, some of their wild rice farms, um, which is a sacred food of great importance to the Ojibwe. Um, what uh, wild rice in their language is called manamun, and um, it really impacted their tribe. And so they um, really care about addressing climate change and being uh, ad uh, protecting and adapting to these impacts. Next slide. The last region is the East Coast. And um, I know some of you are living on the East Coast and um, there are less tribes there, but there are tribes in the East Coast. And many of these tribes engage also like the Pacific Northwest tribes um, in fishing. Um, this also includes um, uh, in, uh, gathering of uh, blueberries and other uh, types of berries. Um, and there's also a dependence on different water resources, including riverine, estuarine, and oceanic water resources. And some of the key impacts to tribes on the East Coast um, are a result of uh, flooding and in increases in snow melt. Uh, increasing in, uh, in snowfall, but also rapid snow melt, impacting uh, fishery habitats, um, uh, scouring of uh, fish habitat and nesting sites, uh, increasing in fish mortality. Uh, warmer water temperatures are impacting um, the quality of the lobsters and their ability for their shells to calcify and um, be of good quality. Again, similar to the Pacific Northwest, they also have impacts of uh, saltwater intrusion, which is impacting their forests, uh, creating forest die-offs and impacting the wildlife and the fish infrastructure, and also causing relocation of tribes there. I want to now move into a specific examples, as I shared with you, a really high level uh, bird's eye view of, you know, all the various impacts um, impacting tribes across, you know, hundreds of tribes across the United States. But I want to share with you one specific example with a tribe that I've been working with um, for 
for almost 15 years now. And that's the largest tribe in Nevada. And um, the moderator was commenting on how she uh, lived in Nevada and Utah and visit uh, the Paiute tribes. So the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe is situated in the um, uh, Truckee River Basin. And they are actually at the very end of the basin. So the water flows from Lake Tahoe downward in, into Pyramid Lake. And along the stretch, um, there's the city of Reno, smaller agricultural and industrial activities, all impacting um, the river as it flows and, and down into uh, Pyramid Lake. Um, early in the 1900, there was a lot of uh, dam construction um, and diversion of water, even to the point of uh, reducing the water to nothing. And so the tribe had to really step up and they secured the water rights to ensure that they were getting water at the very end uh, in this terminal lake. And um, they also became the lead in the Truckee River water settlement, which is um, highly uh, monumental. And um, they also have a fish that they um, really have a deep connection to, which is called the kui. And it's an endangered fish. Um, they also have a fish that they also um, uh have for rec that they use for recreational fishing which is the um also threatened which is the lao cutthroat trout and so the tribe has really emerged as a leader within um this Truckee river basin and i show in the slide a picture of um the stone mother here it, it's, it's a stone made um naturally and it looks like a woman holding a basket and um this is really important uh uh natural symbol for the tribe about their deep connection their origin stories and the fish that is important to them next slide the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe has uh, become a leader in terms of um, talking about climate change. And I had the chance to work with them to do a survey and ask them um, what they thought about climate change and how they were aware. 80% of the tribal members uh, indicated that they um, were aware of climate change and observed changes in their environment. 73% believed that humans played a major role in climate change, and 93% uh, expressed their priority to do climate uh, change action at the national level. Next slide. We also asked them, what are the kinds of um, observations of changes in your environment that you have seen within the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation. And these, this graph shows those uh, key observations. And I want to point out a few. Um, the, the highest observation that the tribal members that were surveyed had seen was 72% saw decreases in surface water. And then 56% um, uh, saw changes in, uh, in increased summer temperatures. 50% saw changes in the fish community, 56% saw decreases in snowpack, and then 57% saw changes in the spring water. And there's another paper that we wrote about com comparison of the tribal um, observations and um, expressions for what they would like to see in terms of climate change action. Um, and there was real distinct differences between tribal members and local ranchers and local farmers. What we did in our partnership with the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe was to work collaboratively to think about adaptive water management strategies using a holistic approach. 
Um, first was to uh, identify um, community water needs and priorities um, by integrating traditional community knowledge with the scientific data and uh, the, the scientific um, literature, and then um, have a collaborative um, uh, activities that was really directed by the community. And we use our expertise to understand the local water systems, but the community is the one that understands their priorities, understands their water resources, their water histories more than we do. So um, together we uh, collaborated on understanding the water systems and then looked at what are the climate change projections and talk about what are um, uh, future water management plans that we could uh, think about. Next slide. So we did a lot of participatory activities, including um, workshops um, that had uh, participatory brainstorming exercise, looking at the environmental water ecological challenges facing the Pyramid Lake and talking about alternatives and solutions to these challenges. Next. And through these discussions, we were able to identify um, the categories of challenges and then the initiatives for managing those solutions, which are listed here. And this is just an example of um, this type of community uh, participatory uh, collaboration. Next slide. We also uh, develop a really simple tool using Excel just to talk about um, the changes, uh, the scenarios and um, climate uh, projections. And um, this was a tool just to see like what could be the potential changes in the water levels in the Pyramid Lake through time. This would be um, status uh, quo with no changes. And so we, uh, you know, toggled the uh, changes in temperature and precipitation and talked about what, what are those scenarios and what could the tribe do to think about um, action towards these changes. We also developed an expert cognitive map. This is on the next slide. And this was a starting point, but then with um, engagement with the tribe, next slide, we um, had the tribe do more details on to what those cascading impacts would be. So these are examples of how we really collaborated with the tribe. Um, one of the things that we really relied in this uh, partnership is uh, traditional gui knowledge guidelines that was developed by um, the Rising Voices Initiative out of UCAR. And these guidelines were developed for uh, you know, anyone interested in working with tribes to um, look at traditional knowledge and how they can be integrated. And so this was to help um, those out there to really be sensitive and to make sure they're working ethically with tribes. What we also did was um, develop some educational tools about the lake. Um, specifically, here's an example of the ecological thresholds of Pyramid Lake species and how they're sensitive to changes in temperature and hydrology. And we use these tools to um, simulate the discussions we had. Another example is a video on the Kui and the Lahau cutthroat migrations. And this was also serving as a tool for our dialogue with the tribal members. Now I wanna end my talk to um, just um, think about uh, climate adaptation or um, resilience. And for indigenous people, what does indigenous resilience mean? And we see um, in the media, some of these um, actions of uh, indigenous uh, protesters, you know, uh, protesting gas pipelines or, um, you know, really fighting for the earth and, um, you know, we see these posters of this activities and um, that's a, a starter for, you know, asking that question, well, what is indigenous resilience? 
Um, to me, when I think about indigenous resilience, I think about my great grandmother who showed here in the slide and her ability to survive and maintain um, our livelihoods despite living in a high desert climate. Um, I think about my grandmother, how she survived, uh, my great grandmother who survived the long walk by um, weaving rugs while being held in internment camps and trading her rugs for food, which has allowed us to be here, for me to be here today. I think about my own grandmother and um, her resilience to survive despite her land being destroyed by mining. I think about my parents and their ability to maintain their language and culture and pass it on to me despite being taken from their home to attend Indian boarding schools thousands of miles away. So I, I think um, collectively, even you know, around the world, we have our own stories of what we think of as resilience. The Oxford Dictionary defines resilience as um, the capacity to recover from difficulties and the ability to uh, spring back into shape. In uh, ecological uh, theories, um, there's a well-known definition by C.S. Holing, who's a Canadian ecologist, who um, coined this term of resilience and adaptive management. Um, and so he has, you know, papers on what is this concept of ecological resilience, um, of the societies and ecological system being perturbed and its ability to balance bounce back and what are thresholds to and that would cause that system to go into a new state. Next slide. But um, for indigenous communities, that definition is different. Um, and I think one of the most formulated ideas and definitions of indigenous resilience I found was with indigenous people of Australia. And the previous speaker talked about New Zealand. Well, this um, is relatively nearby, um, but in Australia, they did a systematic review um, in their country about what people were saying about uh, indigenous resilience. And many of those um, papers and research that were done were by indigenous researchers or researchers that have worked with indigenous communities for a long time. And next slide. And in this paper, um, one of the key uh, definitions about indigenous resilience was coined here by Marion Kikit, who is an Aboriginal scholar and educator. And she said that uh, indigenous resilience is the ability to have a connection and belonging to one's land, family, and culture, therefore an identity, allowing pain and suffering caused from adversities to heal, having a dreaming where the past is brought to the present and the present and the past are taken into the future. A strong spirit that confronts and conquers racism and oppression, strengthening the spirit. The ability is not just to survive, but to thrive in today's dominant culture. So I think um, I wanted to share that definition because it's quite different from C.S. Hawley's definition. Next slide. Well, I've been really thinking about what is indigenous resilient for Native American communities and their resilience um, to face climate change impacts. And so I took um, that hazard and um, uh, risk reduction framework that I introduced to you earlier. And now I wanna share with you um, just a brainstorm of mine of what I think indigenous resilience could be. And stemming from uh, similar to what the Australian researchers propose, I think there's a resilience at the household level, at the community and tribal nation level that all connect together that's important and um, connected to culture, language, uh, family, identity, um, and that these five factors that I talked about all connect to um, the resilience of the community. And I think it's important to delve 
into this deeper and I certainly don't have the answer, but I think um, it's important to go back to the community and ask them uh, what is indigenous resilient. So I'll be doing that next. So my research is going to the net communities, asking the communities what is indigenous resilience in the context of food, energy, water, securities and insecurities, um, the ability to uh, recover from disturbances like climate change and even um, pandemics. Next. I want to conclude with this, and that is uh, tribes have an urgent need to prepare for a response to climate change and must happen in a way that is holistic and considers cultural and traditional values. Uh, uncertainties exist uh, mainly because there's a lot of uncertainties in the data and um, how they all interact. And um, adaptation strategies are most effective if it's integrated into a broader sustainability plan rather than just a standalone. But for Native Americans who have been left out of discussion, it's also very important that all of this um, planning for climate change and adaptation has to be participatory and transparent for Native American communities. Thank you so much for having me here. And um, I look forward to having a discussion with you about your questions. Ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chief, for that very informative uh, and thoughtful and, and helpful presentation. Uh, you've really given us a beautiful uh, overview of uh, not only the indigenous populations in the United States, but also the issues that they confront with climate justice and uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and so I really appreciate your uh, very comprehensive lecture. Um, uh, now we are open to questions again. Uh, if you would go to the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen and type, your, type in your question. Um, uh, Dr. Seaman, do you have a question? I do, thanks Hoda. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about as you were speaking is how um, the experience of native populations, of indigenous populations can be translated um, out to other communities. What are the lessons that, that can be learned and how can the knowledge be shared um, effectively um, with those um, to kind of improve responses elsewhere to climate change? I think that there are lessons learned in terms of um, other communities that are um, off-grid or have strong cultural ties or community connections in terms of, um, you know, the the considerations that need to be taken um, when partnerships are formed with outside entities. And I do value partnerships when it comes to, you know, universities um, and, and other entities, uh, relief organizations that work, want to work with communities. But I think that um, it's really important to consider the uniqueness of these communities and ensuring that there is really transparency, that the community is driving their priorities and not necessarily this colonialistic framework of like a savior complex of coming in to help a community, but rather this is a true and equal and equitable partnership where the community is taking the lead, their priorities are um, at the forefront and um, that the knowledge sharing is really um, approved by them so that, um, you know, it's not uh, data mining or, um, you know, helicopter research where the knowledge is just taken away, but really asking the community, is it okay that this knowledge is shared? Um, and, and is it okay for it to be published? But also that, the community is involved in every step of the way, you know, from the very beginning, the formulation of the research, questions and priorities, to the data collection, analysis, all the way to the end in co-authorship, where the community members are co-authoring. And so they're valued and 
and, and involve in every single step of the way, and they're approving every single step that is taken. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Coda, just one quick follow up if I can. Um, I was also wondering if there is um, communication and collaboration between different groups, so across different countries. So you mentioned in your presentation Australia. So are different groups working together on these challenges and, and how they're responding? I think there's definitely uh, collaboration across I mean, within the countries itself. Like I remember I, I heard the previous um, uh, speaker say, um, talk about the collaborations. I think there's strong collaborations within the countries. And then I think there's some collaboration across, you know, internationally and i think a lot of that happens with the international dialogues like with the united nations or indigenous peoples forums that happen and i think um those leaders are working to trickle down to have those collaboration come more down to the community but there's definitely collaborations with the international leaders of indigenous peoples who are trying to make that connection across. Um, but I think we still have a long ways to go in terms of like more integrated at the community level in terms of those types of collaborations. Are there any other questions for Dr. Chief? I think not. Again, thank you so much, Dr. T. Oh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say I thought that was a fantastic presentation. Really, really, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Willis. Thank you, Dr. Willis. I, again, I, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. T, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, and I would like to thank all of our speakers today. We had six outstanding speakers who really took us on a journey uh, and gave us a, a deep understanding of uh, the, this whole area of climate justice and environmental justice. And I'm so glad that we have recorded today's conference, which should be, uh, I think, uploaded on our YouTube channel by sometime next week. And, and so I, I look forward to many of you uh, listening again to these presentations and uh, the, the amazing knowledge that was imparted to us today. So thanks to all the speakers. Um, just before we go, I wanna just quickly uh, uh, give a couple of announcements about our next upcoming events. The first one, uh, which is on September uh, 14, is a presentation that focuses on monuments and memory, uh, specifically what is to be done with the 2,000 plus Confederate monuments and memorials still on display in the United States, uh, and, and uh, to, to carry this important discussion, uh, we have a, the, uh, Ms. Kristen Kirsten Mullen, uh, who is a folklorist and the founder of the Art Effectual and Arts Consulting Practice and Carolina Circuit Writers, which is a liter literary consortium that brings expressive writers of color to the Carolinas. Um, her writing uh, can be found in museum catalogs and journals and in commercial media and includes black culture and History Matter, The American Prospect, which examines the politics of founding Black cultural institutions. Very interesting uh, uh, book. And she is now a co-editor, a co-author, uh, pardon me, co-author with William Darity of the uh, of forthcoming book entitled From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st century. So don't forget to look for this event on our website and our social media, September 14 at 12 noon uh, Eastern time. And then the following day on September 15, we have a symposium, which is extremely important and timely on critical race theory, public debates and teaching in the classroom 
uh, again, an issue which unfortunately has become very politicized. Uh, and for this symposia, we have uh, symposium. We have Professor Rashan Ray of the Sociology Department in, uh, at the University of Maryland, with whom we collaborate on many events. And then uh, Dr. Crystal Marie and uh, Dr. Victor Ray. Uh, Crystal Marie is from uh, Sociology Professor in African American Studies at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. And Professor Victor Ray is the Wendell Miller Associate Professor, Department of Sociology and Criminology in African American Studies at the University of Iowa. So we really encourage you to join us for these very important events. Thank you so much to our viewers for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events. Thank you.